Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more of the Great War. This time we're on to week 72. Britain on the run. The siege of Kut al um, um, Kut al Whenever an, there's an A and an L followed by another A, I always butcher the pronunciation. There's a lot of A's here, I'm not good with my A's. Alamara, Alamara, that sounds right. Still feels like, st I don't know, it still feels like I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> Before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. Let's not waste any more time. Let's just go ahead and dive into the siege here. Throughout 1915, the British Indian Army had been marching up the Tigris River, triumphantly winning battle after battle as it closed in on Baghdad, but Woo! no longer. This week finds that army in dire straits, under siege Boo. at Kut, with no relief in sight. Not yay. Not woo. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week, we saw the remnants of the Serbian army and even the civilian population fleeing to and through the Albanian mountains from the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Bulgarian invaders. The refugees were in dire straits, and many froze and starved to death. Further north, the Italian front had gone quiet as the fourth battle of the Isonzo River had ended, and indeed, the arrival of winter had shut down most of the action on all of the European fronts. Here's what followed. There were no offensives on the Western Front since battles in Artois and Champagne had ended a month ago, and it seemed there would be none until after the winter, though last December and Jan That man right there, he's having a good time. He's trying to make the best of a shitty situation, and I respect that. January, the first champagne dance. offensive oh, raged on and on, so you never know. But there was still action. This week, the Germans concentrated reinforcements and reserves. Need more videos like that. Of, I don't know, it just... It really... There's always that disconnect that I feel like happens when you see old paintings or old photos and videos of the early 1900s here because it's over a century ago, where they're so far away, at least for younger, for older generations, right? You'd be looking at people here that would be like, maybe your grandparents, uh, if you're part of, the, of, of an older generation. But for people my generation and stuff, no, Mike, let's see, my great grandfather, he, if my math is right, he was either born during the war or after World War I? Because my grandfather was 1940, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so, you know, the disconnect there. Uh, then you see videos of them just like doing random things like that, like doing a little dancey dance, trying to, trying to lighten the mood there, trying to have some fun in war, really bring some humanization to it all. Serves in Flanders and Artois. It's just a small little thing. But didn't take much ground. They even lost a bit of it as flooding on the 7th in the Isère region forced them to abandon many of their advanced trenches there. On the 8th, six British airplanes bombed a German storage depot in the Somme region and the aerodrome at Hervilly. A British cargo boat ran aground off the Belgian coast and three German hydroplanes tried to sink it, but they were driven off by Allied planes. And deep snow in the Vosch prevented anything but artillery attacks over there. But if the British weren't especially active on one front, on another one, they certainly were. On December 5th, British forces met the Bulgarians for the first time as the Bulgarians attacked them in Macedonia at two points, Demir Kapu Gorge and on the Rebrovo Doran Road. The first of those managed to gain the British trenches, but the counterattack was successful and they drove back the Bulgarians. Woo. The second Bulgarian attack, with far superior numbers of men to the British, took the first British trench line but couldn't reach the second. East of the Vardar River, General Georgi Todorov continued to attack the British with around 100,000 men. On the 6th, under the cover of a dense mist, they managed to get close unseen and pounded the mostly Irish regiments with high explosive shells. The British were forced back several kilometers. Now, French General Maurice Sarrel, also on the Vardar with his forces, faked an attack on Istip. And then, before the Bulgarians realized what he was doing, he had gotten away with all of his stores and gone to Krivolak, blowing up bridges and tearing up railroad tracks behind him. By the 5th, he had reached the north end of Demir Kapu Gorge, not too far from the British positions. And here, 
the French finally had to fight. The Bulgarian attack was determined, but the French held them off and managed an almost ridiculously precarious retreat. The only way out was a single narrow railroad running on a narrow shelf that was cut into the rock high above. Man, we love narrow passages. It's great for armies. Yeah, armies, or retreating armies, they always do great in narrow passages. That's totally not a problem. Not at all. The Vardar River, but they made it with all their supplies. Fuck, apparently not a problem for them, actually. And got to Gradets where they dug in. The Bulgarians attacked them on the 8th and 9th, but were driven off. And on the 10th, the French had made contact with the- Hold on, that man looked really short. I'm sorry, I gotta judge this person. They both look I don't know. They look like- No, they look like they have super fucking long torsos. And then short fucking legs. Like, look- Maybe it's just the boots and the way the pants are scrunching that's making them look shorter. Like, this man looks taller than this- Well- this man is taller than this man because this guy's further away, but he looks about the same height as the one closer to the camera. Hmm. I'm being very judgmental. ...and made contact with the British left flank. But it wasn't just in Macedonia that the British were being forced back. It was also happening in Mesopotamia. For nine days, General Charles Townsend had been leading his forces back down the Tigris River away from Tessaphon. The British Indian forces had won the battle there, but it was a Pyrrhic victory, for the casualties taken had destroyed their own fighting capability. There were no reserves, and they couldn't just hang around in the open desert. But the retreat to Kut was a nightmare. The transport facilities were totally inadequate. I'm going to read you a quote that's not for the squeamish, so some of you may want to fast forward. This is from Major Robert Carter of the Indian Medical Service about the arrival of a hospital ship. Bring on the gore. I just ate, <laughs> because I don't learn my lessons with this series. I'm a hungry boy in the morning, and I record these in the morning. I wake up, I shower, then I eat, and then I'm here. I'm hungry, <laughs> why eat? And then I regret it every time I watch a Great War video. <laughs> ...on the Tigris. I saw that she was absolutely packed with men. When she was about 300 or 400 yards off, it looked as if she was festooned with ropes. The stench when she was close was quite definite, and I found that what I mistook for ropes were dried stalactites of human feces. No! The patients were so huddled and crowded together on the ship that they could not perform the offices of nature clear of the edge of the ship. We found a mass of men huddled up. They were lying in a pool of dysentery about 30 feet square. They were covered with dysentery and dejecta from head to foot. With regard to the first man I examined, I put my hand into his trousers and thought he had a hemorrhage. His trousers were full about to the waist with something warm and slimy. I took my hand out and thought it was a blood clot. It was dysentery. Behind these wounded, Townsend and his forces... Uh-uh. No. Oh. Whoa. Hmm. Okay. Made it to Kut on December okay. 3rd, where his superior... You know, it, it's, it's photographic imagery that will get my stuff. But that was a fucked up quote. That actually... Quotes usually don't get me, but that quote got me a bit like, oh. General John Nixon thought he should stand and fight. Could Townsend succeed, as he had at the Siege of Chitral in 1895, or would Kut fall? Well, the Ottoman attacks throughout the month were repulsed with heavy losses, so they left enough men to hold Kut under siege and marched past Kut to take defensive positions downriver at Sheikh Saad. Inside Kut were 14,500 British and Indian troops and their dependents, and about 6,000 Arab civilians. All of these needed to be fed. And on December 7th, Townsend claimed he had enough food to last for 60 days and kept his men on full rations while demanding that Nixon send a relief force. That would take some time. And here's another note to round out the week. 
On December 6th, Esad Pasha declares himself pro-allies. Now, you may not remember him, but he was Minister of War and Minister of the Interior in Albania briefly in 1914. He revolted against the prince and was exiled to Italy, but now he was back and had a tiny kingdom he'd carved out of Albania oh. where he welcomed Serbian I was thinking this was one of the three Pashas of the Ottomans. ...refugees and expelled all Austrians and Bulgarians. And there you have the week. Isolated events in the West, the Eastern Front still at a standstill, but huge action in the Balkans as the French, British, and Serbs fought the Bulgarians, while thousands of Serbian soldiers and civilians were still fleeing into the frozen mountains of Albania to escape the invaders. In the Middle East, the British were bottled up at Kut, and at Gallipoli, right, Gallipoli, I haven't mentioned oh God, Gallipoli. Gallipoli this week, but there was a development, a big one. On December 7th, 1915, the politicians finally made up their mind. The British would evacuate Gallipoli. Woo. Peter Hart wrote a great book on Gallipoli, but here's a quote from another book of his, The Great War, that sums up his feelings about Gallipoli. Apologists for the Gallipoli campaign have long tried to boast of what could have been with a heavy emphasis on if only. This fails to recognize that the Allies fought the campaign with levels of naval and military support that were considered acceptable until the Turks <laughs> defeated them. Time and time again, Hamilton promised success. Again and again, he failed. Gallipoli was one of a series of military Easterner adventures launched without proper analysis of the global strategic situation, without consideration of the local tactical situation, ignoring logistical reality. I'm going to disagree on um, that part on the global aspect of it. Fucking, how far do I got to go back? Um, proper analysis of the global strategic situation. I'm going to disagree with that point because what they're doing on the Western Front is they are holding the Germans back. Um, I think... Now, obviously, perhaps providing more support to Townsend's campaign in uh, Mesopotamia uh, would be better than putting forces in Gallipoli, diverting resources to Gallipoli, just instead focusing maybe not on, on the Middle East there. Um, however, while the latter points here in this quote I would agree with, right, Ignoring the local tactical situation, so lo realistic logistical things that they could actually provide to a Gallipoli front and stuff. I think the f Gallipoli is a good idea in the sense of the global strategic situation because it is opening up another front. When you look at the strategic situation of the Austro-Hungarians, the Ottoman Empire, and Germany... They cannot wage a war like the British and French can, which the British and French can open up several fronts and use men from their colonies to fight the war for them, which is what the British are doing with India. They're using Indian troops to fight in Mesopotamia, right? Um, and in other parts. Uh, African troops right now are holed up in Africa, but once they're free, they'll be coming up north, right? Um, so I think. It has a proper analysis of the global strategic situation. However, it is lacking in everything else, which is what is proving Gallipoli to be just a failure. Um, however, coming to the conclusion based on, you know, the, the want of, of another front, I think, is a good idea. Was Gallipoli the right choice for that? Or perhaps they should have put more resources there. <laughs> Maybe a better general. <laughs> Um, uh, and, or maybe they, definitely they should have realized sooner that it was a lost cause and that they should have pulled out months ago, right? Um, but I think, of course, you know, the issue of what if. I still consider Gallipoli a good idea when taking into account the global strategic situation and how Austro- how the Austro-Hungarians, Germans, and Ottomans cannot fight, cannot truly handle multi-front wars. The German strategic plan is purely based on trying to make the war a single-front war. The, the Germans 
are aware of their own downfall of their own uh, weakness, right? They cannot fight multi front wars. So like opening up Gallipoli from that sense, good idea in my opinion. Um, but of course, as the rest of the quote says, the British Anzac forces they're lacking. And the French are lacking in le- the ability to supply logistics to the front. They're lacking uh, proper tactical awareness on the front, the local, local tactical awareness. But I disagree on this first point. <laughs> Without consideration of the local tactical situation, ignoring logistical realities, underestimating the strength of the opposition, and predicated on a hugely optimistic assessment of the military capabilities of their own troops. I don't know. I don't. Largely, I don't think you can really entirely blame it on troops. I think, I think it mainly falls to the generals here. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel like when the when troops have a good general, the troops do good. When the troops have a bad general, the troops do bad because. You know, a soldier is taught to follow orders from the general, from their commanding officer. Um, that, that, that's the point of an infantry grunt. That's what they're there for. They're there to follow orders and do what's told to them. Um, if you got a bad general, the military capability of your troops is going to plummet. And I think the British here had a really bad general. <laughs> not for nothing is hubris regarded as the English disease. Vital resources had been drawn away from where they really matter. But I do agree with this point, especially here, the hubris of, you know, the English disease. Definitely a thing. Gallipoli achieved nothing but to provide the Turks with an opportunity to slaughter British and French troops in copious numbers in a situation in which everything was in the defenders' favor. Meanwhile, back on the Western Front was the real enemy, the German Empire. Men, guns, and munitions were in the process of being deployed to Gallipoli during the first British offensive at Neuve Chapelle. They were still there when the Germans launched their- This, I'm gonna disagree with this point as well. Because there weren't really, like, if we look at the casual, casualty rates and the sheer amount of men that are fighting on the Western Front, the amount of men and supplies sent to Gallipoli, had they been put on the Western Front, honestly probably would not have made that much of a difference. There weren't that many people in Gallipoli when we look at how many men die in a single day on the Western Front? How many men are put into single offensives on the Western Front? Um, so, Gallipoli troops could have been diverted to Mesopotamia. I will concede that. That's probably where they would have been better served. Their supplies and their manpower. Mesopotamia. Because it's obvious that the Ottomans are pretty weak there. And that Gallipoli isn't tying that many Ottoman troops up. Um, but to say that they would have been better served on the Western Front? No. Well, not in my opinion. Their deadly gas attacks at Ypres in April. During the debacles of Aubert's Ridge and Festubert. And during the first great push at the Battle of Luz in September. This was the real war. Gallipoli was nothing but a foolish sideshow. Peter Hart's book about Gallipoli was a tremendous help for my research on the subject, and I highly recommend it. If you want to get a copy of it, you may want to check out our Amazon store where we get a commission for each purchase you make. You can find the link below the video. Now, Winston Churchill was one of the main architects of Gallipoli, and of course, an important man throughout the war and the 20th century. If you want to find out more about his deeds during World War I, you can click right here for our... All right, and that was Britain on the Run, the Siege of Kut al Amara, which we didn't really get much information on the Siege of Kut. Uh, getting started, I guess. But that was the Great War, Week 72. I talked a lot this time around. I had a lot to say. It was good. Uh, remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.